Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Podcast, presented by Canon Press. Welcome to the podcast. This is episode 216. My name is Douglas Wilson, and I'm really glad you joined us. It's good to have you back again. Here you are. Look at us go. As the old Chinese curse has it, may you live in interesting times. Uh, we do live in interesting times, do we not? We are now, believe it or not, less than a year away from the midterm elections. <laughs> it's been uh, over a year since uh, the presidential election. And that presidential election seemed, well, it seems to be in more recent memory because normally the presidential election is the run-up to the election, then the election night, and then you have the winner, and then you get used to that. We've had all kinds of drama running up to the presidential election of 2020, and then there were all the allegations of cheating and recounts and the, the, the Arizona uh, drama and, and so on. and then. Of course, um, Biden is not Mr. Um, get out there and speak in public a lot, and Kamala Harris is is even more reticent to get out in public. Uh, so it doesn't seem like we we've been living under a new vigorous administration. The Biden proposals are audacious when it comes to uh, how many trillion we're going to spend and so on, but things seem pretty gum things seem gummed up pretty good, and. Um, Senator Manchin and and Sinema uh, on the Democratic side have been holding things up. And so consequently, it doesn't seem like it's been over a year since the election. It seems like, aren't we still sort of in it, right? But a year's passed since the election, and that means it's just a year to go to the midterms. Now, if you believe uh, or if you suspect, I'll just put it in two categories. If you believe that there was electoral funny business in the presidential election in 2020, or if you suspect, or if you have grave suspicions that there was that kind of funny business, it will be easy for you to be cynical about whether or not there will be relief in the midterms. All right. Well, what's the use, right? Because if they could do something that big with the showdown between Trump and Biden, then how can we trust any election at all? Well, look at the um, look at what just happened in Virginia in the gubernatorial uh, race between Terry McAuliffe, Terry McAuliffe losing, and I'm getting old. I just forgot the uh, the uh, Republican name. Is it Youngin? Youngin. Uh, anyway, don't ask me to spell it. And everybody, you you should know right why McAuliffe lost. Terry McAuliffe lost because. He made the mistake of having all his extra ballots printed up in China, and they were sitting in a freighter off of Long Beach. <laughs> so, there you go. If someone so attached to the center of democratic politics could lose in a state like Virginia, that means that elections can still make a difference. But here's the big reason. Let's assume, just for the sake of discussion, just to assume for the sake, not to debate whether there was cheating or not in the presidential election. But if there were cheating, what would it take? Right? If there were cheating, what would it take? If, if the vote had gone the other way in four squeaker states, and it had gone the other way by fewer than 50,000 votes total out of millions upon millions of votes cast, then it would have been an electoral college tie. Okay. In other words, we're we're talking about an election in the electoral college system. That kind of election has pinch points. Now I still support the electoral college system. I still like it. It just means that in the electoral college system, cheating, if it were to occur, would be of a different nature than cheating in a local election, right? So uh, what that means is if you capture certain pinch points in a national election, you can sway the whole thing. Well, the midterms are going to be very, very different. 
the midterms are different because you've got a host of local elections and there are no pinch points in in this sense. It's not like you can there are places the left could cheat in the midterms, but the places where they have th- it wrapped up se- securely enough to be able to cheat are places that they were going to win anyway. So they're not going to be able to do it as readily in, in swing districts or in uh, solidly red districts. So what that means is people are not hallucinating when they discuss the prospect of, and don't get cocky early, don't get your hopes up early, don't become lack, don't say, of course, it's going to be okay. But it's starting to look like a significant red wave election. Okay. It seems to me that that's the way the story is going. So we continue on with uh, the podcast. Uh, This is episode 216, and we continue our study of sin in the New Testament. And the word eke means in vain. E I K E. Eke means in vain. This is one of those words that does not represent sin essentially but is only sinful depending on the context, or is only sinful or not depending on the context. Here's an example of a, of a use that does not represent sin. This is from Romans 13, 4. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. There it is, in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So, it is not a sin. Uh, it, you know, this is simply a, an expression where Paul says, the magistrate does not bear the sword for nothing. He does not bear it in vain. And that's simply a, a, a usage that is not expressing any kind of sinfulness, right? But we do have some, it, it's talking about uh, the effectual, uh, how effectual is his bearing of the sword. But we have some sinful contexts mentioned in Scripture. Here's one from Matthew 5.22. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother, without a cause, there it is, without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. So, being angry for no good reason is a sin. So, Jesus says, being angry with his brother, Eke, in vain. Being angry with your brother without a reason without a, um, a just cause, is sinful. Another sin would be that of believing in Christ in vain. All right, so that's um, 1 Corinthians 15, 2. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. So believing in vain or believing with a case of vanity is sinful. It's believing in Christ falsely. It's believing in Christ spuriously. In line with believing in vain, it would also be sinful and wasteful to suffer for your beliefs and then to do so in vain. So, if you believe in, if you believe in Christ in vain, that's bad. But if you believe in Christ and are persecuted for believing in Christ, you suffer for believing in Christ, but you come a cropper at the end, that's, uh, that's no good also, uh, Galatians 3, 4. And that could happen through circumstance or persecution, whatever. In Galatians 3, 4, it says, have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? Uh, He says that twice. So, are you really going to go through all that difficulty in vain? So, it's bad enough to believe in Christ in vain, but if you believe in Christ going through great difficulties and you do that in vain, that's even worse. And then we have the sin of plain, old-fashioned vanity. Not looking in a mirror vanity, but uh, the vanity of froth and bubble. Uh, Colossians 2.18 Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Colossians 2.18 So when someone is vainly propped up by his sinful mind, his fleshly mind, then he is obviously sinning. What he's doing is he's inventing ways of worship. He's inventing liturgies. He's inventing rituals that he thinks that will somehow please God. God. God 
So we come now to the book review section of the podcast, episode 216. And what I want to review this time is a little booklet. It's a it's a not a book, but a booklet by B.B. Warfield called The Emotional Life of Our Lord. The Emotional Life of Our Lord. Uh, this was just a, a very telling, interesting booklet. I really enjoyed it. I'm going and I'm going to be uh, going to be reading it again because there were a number of things that, shall we say, popped out at me. When Jesus goes to uh, the tomb of Lazarus, for example, what Warfield does is he goes through uh, the Gospels and he talks about, interacts with, discusses every instance of Christ being described as uh, expressing or expressing or feeling any particular emotion. So, when the disciples turn away the little children and he's indignant, or when he looks at the, at the people who are like sheep without a shepherd and he has compassion on them, or this example, when, uh, and, but there are some surprises. So, for example, when Jesus comes to the grave of Lazarus right before he raises him from the dead, I think a number of translations say he was troubled in spirit, things like that. But uh, Warfield points out that Jesus, just prior to bringing Lazarus back from the dead, was enraged. Now, I, I was, have been accustomed to uh, say that Jesus, going off of English um, translations, that Jesus got angry in the Gospel of Mark when he healed the man with a withered hand just before he did, did that. And he looked around at the, at the men in the synagogue. Is it lawful to save life or destroy? And they didn't answer. And he was angry, and he healed the man there. And then it doesn't say that he was angry when he cleansed the temple, but I've always surmised that he probably was when he cleansed the temple. And I thought that that was it. But uh, Warfield goes through um, other instances and shows in the Greek that Jesus was angry on other distinct occasions. And this was one of them. Now, what was he angry with? Uh, Warfield assumes, and I think I think I agree with him here, that Jesus, when he comes to raise Lazarus from the dead, is angry at death, is angry at the bondage that that the human race is in. Remember that Mary and Martha and Lazarus were dear to Christ, and Jesus comes to his grave, to the grave of Lazarus, and is angry, and he raises the dead. If I could say one other thing about this, we're told in um, Ephesians, for example, to put away all anger. Uh, but also in Ephesians, we're told to be angry and sin not. Be angry, quoting the Psalms, be angry and sin not. And then we're told to put away anger and clamor and wrath and malice, right? All of, all of that stuff. So there's a kind of anger that is counterproductive. James says man's anger does not serve God's righteousness. Man's anger doesn't accomplish God's purposes. When we get angry in the flesh, the, and the end result is broken crockery or a hole in the sheetrock, that kind of anger is destructive. Fleshly anger is a destructive force, a destructive power. When um, Jesus got angry in Mark, the end result was the man with the withered hand had a healed hand. When Jesus got angry, the end result was Lazarus, who was dead, was raised from the dead. His anger was constructive. For more from Doug about how Christians can do the work of cultural reformation, check out his book, Rules for Reformers. Get your copy today at canonpress.com.